This is the Construction Leading Edge podcast from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com and ConstructionBusinessAccelerator.com. My name is Todd DeWald. It's my job to help you, the construction business owner and leader, eliminate chaos and maximize profits. In this episode, you're going to hear an interview with construction business owner Mike McCollum. He is a drywall contractor from Oklahoma, and here's what you're going to learn. You're going to learn why the quickest way to go out of business is to do work based on someone else's numbers. Mike will explain why everybody has a boss. He'll also talk about the mistakes that he made the first time around as a drywall construction business owner. Mike will teach you about the danger of not charging enough for your work, how that becomes a slippery slope and kind of a downward spiral. We talk about why the term cash flow may be a misnomer. Mike explains the importance of protecting your credit. And then Mike explains the the number one quality that he looks for in a potential candidate that he's thinking about hiring. This is a good interview with a guy who has owned a construction business, so take advantage of this. He he is a self-proclaimed former long-haired drywall finisher who now owns a business in Oklahoma. So you're going to learn a lot from this. Before we get into that interview, I do have a couple of resources I want to share with you. If you manage a project or a crew on a construction site, you know how important timely, clear communication is to keep your team safe and keep your projects on track. Over the years, many have turned to text messaging as a way to communicate with their teams and their subs. It gets information across quickly and it's easy to use because everyone knows how to text. But these messages aren't stored in one place and they're hard to manage and stay on top of. And because messages and pictures aren't saved, they're not organized and they're not searchable, It makes it almost impossible to refer back to those conversations later in the event of a dispute. There's good news, though. I recently discovered an app called Field Chat. Field Chat is a messaging app purpose-built for construction teams. It alleviates what I like to call the Bermuda Triangle of information between the field, the office, and the client. With Field Chat, all of your conversations on a job site happen in one place. Project managers can organize foremen, superintendents, and subcontractors by channels and start messaging using the mobile app or text. It also integrates with text messaging, so it's easy to include anyone in a conversation, whether it's someone on your own team that refuses to learn technology or a trade partner or a sub that just prefers to keep text messaging rather than downloading something new. Where was Field Chat when I ran my construction business? I needed a tool like this to keep our operations running smoothly. Instead of all the fragmented conversations that let left important people out and commitments that were made that I could no longer find proof of. Here's what this tool means to you. More time, better documentation, less mistakes, and simplified dispute resolution. Field Chat is offering you, the Construction Leading Edge podcast listener, 15% off your subscription. Just go to fieldchat.com forward slash edge. You can start your free trial right now and see how it feels to have communications that free up more of your time. Go to fieldchat.com forward slash edge. Have you ever wondered how the big successful contractors do it? How do they grow consistently? Why don't they have cash flow issues? What are they doing that you're not? Well, I've put together a free video series that I want to get in your hands that has helped hundreds of people. It's called The Secrets of Successful Contractors. Here's what you're going to get when you sign up for this free video series. You're going to learn about some of the strategies that big contractors use that you may not know about. You'll find out how the big contractors grow their business without hiring more people. You'll learn how you can boost your profits without chasing down new customers. And you'll find out, if nothing else, if if there's only one thing you get from this video series that's worth the time, it's the hidden costs that could be killing your bottom line that you don't even know about. So if you want to get your hands on this free video series, all you need to do is go to constructionbusinessaccelerator.com forward slash secrets, and you'll get instant access to your free video series. Now, without further ado, let's get into my interview with Mike McCollum. All right, Mike, thanks for being on the podcast. How's everything going today? Oh, it's going well. How are you, Todd? Good. So we uh, were recording this on what, and here we are in early May 2020, hopefully on the downhill slide of the COVID-19 pandemic. We were commiserating a little bit 
before I hit record, but it seems like everything's opening back up. Um, so before, we don't need to talk about that. If you're listening to this anytime in the near future, you've heard plenty about that. So we're going to talk about some other stuff today. Um, but uh, before we jump into to some of the questions I have for you about starting your business and moving up from being a, as you, I think you described yourself as a long haired drywall finisher to now a business owner. Um, Tell us a little bit about where you're at in the country and what kind of work you do. Uh, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. um, And uh, I'm a drywall contractor. Uh, We do mostly high end, uh, residential homes and, uh, light commercial, uh, anything to do with drive, that sort of thing also. And, um, how many employees do you have? We have 14 actual employees and then uh, a lot of subcontractor piece worker guys too. At any one time, how many guys might, be working on your job sites, including subcontractors? Oh, probably 30 or so, I'd okay. say. And how long have you been in business? Uh, well, with my son, we've been in business about eight years now. And okay. uh, this is my second go at it. Um, I had a, a business before several years ago and uh, in the drywall business, but I've teamed up with my son now and we have a partnership with him a couple gotcha. of time. Got it. So tell me about what kind of work you were doing before you started your business the first time. <clears throat> uh, I was a drywall finisher, um, just working as piece work. I also worked uh, hourly for some of the bigger commercial companies. Uh, I was a foreman for a little while for a commercial outfit. Um, decided to try piece work and uh, see if I can make a little bit more money. And for folks who aren't familiar with that, the piece work term, can you explain what that means? Yeah, it's working by either by the foot or by the sheet. Um, or just get paid by the job, you know, instead of hourly, you're in charge of filing your own taxes and your own expenses. You're more of a contract subcontract from a subcontractor. Um, it's done quite a bit around here in Oklahoma. Most in, in our trade anyway, that's mostly subcontracted out by the foot for residential anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've seen it even in my area in uh, Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, residential and even some commercial work is, is yeah. handled that way. It seems to be pretty prevalent in the, the drywall industry. So let's go back to when you were an employee working for another company doing commercial work. And as I recall, you were in California. Is that right? Yep. Um, how did you make the decision? Let's talk about you. There you were. You, whoop, and you were thinking about going into business. Um, what was your biggest concern about starting a business and going into business for yourself? Uh, I had a family pretty young. Uh, my oldest, I was 24 when Josh was born. So um, when I started the first time in business, I was pretty young. Uh, and I was concerned with the security of leaving a full-time job to jump in and try to make your own way. It's uh, pretty scary if you don't have, you know, prospects or a lot of work lined up already. And let's talk about um, security. Which is more secure, in your opinion, being an employee, working in the trades, or um, working for yourself? Uh, Being an employee, by far. You don't Mm -hmm. have to, you just have to show up and work and get to go home at 3.30 and not have to worry about it, not have to worry if your check's there. And when you have people working for you, you have people that have families and are counting on you to provide them with the living and or provide them with work for and a check. And, you know, 
it's a big responsibility. So you were concerned about security. You had a family to take care of. How did you, how did you get past that concern? What, what made you decide to, to make the jump and go into business for yourself? Well, I always kind of kept track from work and piece work um, and how much I was doing when I was working for a company by the hour. I would see how much money I was making for that company and be like, man, I could be putting this in my own pocket. But, you know, I didn't realize all the ins and outs of business and overhead. And, you, of course, you think when you're an hourly employee, you automatically think your boss is just – has a lot more money than they do usually. But uh, that was the main thing was uh, wanting to make more money and uh, having the opportunity to get paid for what I was worth. Cause I always felt like I worked really hard and hustled and put in the effort. I felt I should be rewarded for it. And that's the only way to do it is to get out and do it on your own. I remember, um, having that exact same thought. Uh, I was a project manager for a pretty large commercial general contractor mm-hmm. and I'd been there about four years, I think four years and the company did annual reviews and I looked back over, you know, I, I had gotten to the project manager role a couple of years ahead of schedule made a lot of money on projects, things were going really well. And I remember having an annual review with one of the vice presidents named Dan. And he said, hey, things are going great, you know, et cetera, we appreciate it. Then told me, here's your, here's your, your bonus and your raise for next year. And it was a pretty moderate number. So I asked, after, this is about the third or fourth review, I said, how? how do you guys determine, how is my compensation determined? What's the math? Because there's no back and forth. You just come in here and you you tell me what it's going to be. And he said, well, he basically explained to me that everybody that got hired on at the same time I did got the same raise at the same bonus. I wasn't going to get promoted until everybody else in my class was ready. Hmm. I was like, "So, so you're telling me, this is exactly what I said. So you're telling me that my compensation is determined by everybody else and their performance. And he said, yeah. And I was like, (laughs) I I can't believe that you're telling me that. And how, how demotivating. And that's, that's when I made the decision. I've got to, I can't do this. This, I would have been better. I wish he wouldn't, I wish he would not have told me that. So, yeah, yeah it's like, I had experience hey, like that in college, yeah, <laughs> group projects, you know, similar to where everybody's grade counts to, you know, the one or two people that are actually doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. I, I say my joke about uh, group projects is when, um, when I die, I want Shane and Monty who are my group partners to come to my funeral and be my pallbearers and lower me into my grave so they can let me down one last time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that's all they ever did. And frankly, there was a, I had one project. It was a, a group paper. I mean, how is that supposed to work? How does a group write a paper? And I yeah. said, look guys, I'm going to make this real easy for you. I'm going to write the paper and you don't have to do anything we're going to get an A and you just sit back <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. So yeah, that oh, I am not yeah. a fan of group projects at yeah, all. That was, um, that was an experience with it as well. <laughs> hate it. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. most, uh, most projects in real life are, are done by a group, but um, you yeah, want to, yeah. I guess the, the key is you want to be the boss. You want to be the, the, the leader, the person with the, uh, the steering wheel, the levers in your hands so you can actually control, control your destiny. Um, yeah. Or at least work for one that rewards you for your effort. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, that's a common misconception is that the only way to be entrepreneurial and the only way to get rewarded for effort is to start your own business. But I know a lot of people who work for companies and they are entrepreneurial because mm-hmm 
the owner of that company lets them be entrepreneurial. They, they set it up so they're like, hey, here's, here's a, an opportunity for you. You can basically run your business inside a business, get rewarded, get all the, the upside, all the benefits of being entrepreneurial without having to deal with all the, the back office type headaches. And that's, that's a perfectly good thing to do for, for a lot yeah. of people. Well, I think if they want to get younger people interested in construction, they're going to have to approach things differently anyway. Because when I started in the late 80s, everybody's really hard nosed. And mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the young kids nowadays, they do, you know, you yell at them or something, they don't take that too well. So it's not very encouraging to be, nobody wants to be yelled at. And there's different, <clears throat> different ways of approaching you know, dealing with employees now. Yeah, I worked, I worked with, I worked with an old superintendent. Well, he was a project manager. He was almost at retirement age and he had been a superintendent back in the seventies probably. And he bragged about how he fired every union carpenter in the hall on his, oh, they'd send a guy out and I'd send him back. I'd fire his ass and I fired every carpenter in the hall and good for you, but how are you going to get work done if you keep firing everybody? That's that's not it's not a it's not something to be proud of. And he never like a miserable old guy. Ah, that was pretty much my assessment. And actually, I don't want to digress too much, but I remember I got a call one one day. I'd worked with him for a few months, and I had to get away from him. And I got a call or had a meeting, and found out that I was going to go work on. A, a long project with him, like a, a year long project. And I think all the color just left my face. I was like, Oh, <laughs> and fortunately they, they elected uh, to put me somewhere else. So, um, oh, yes, yeah. you're, you're exactly right. You can't, you can't treat people that way. Maybe that's how you were brought up. I, I started off in the nineties and I dealt with some, some pretty rough, rough guys who thought you had to quote, pay your dues. Yeah, exactly. And, if you feel like young people have to pay their dues, then um, you shouldn't be surprised when they leave because right, exactly. they're not going to do that. They don't, they don't believe that and they don't have to pay their dues. So, um, so let's go back to before you owned a business, what was one thing that you believed to be true about owning a business that you were surprised to find out was not true after you became an owner? Well, that, if you own a business, you just, you know, be rolling in the money and work whenever you want, be taking a vacation on a beach somewhere and just basically taking off any time. But uh, that was way wrong. You know, so, so what I would you say? Way more hours than I ever did. <laughs> so, so you're saying you don't start a, you don't start a business so that you can work less. You actually have to work more? <laughs> that seems to be the case with me anyway. I don't know. Maybe some others do it differently, but for me, uh, I definitely work more. I even I, work not working, it seems, but. Yeah, I, that's, that's pretty consistent. Uh, at least for the first few years, you should expect to put in a lot of hours. It, it's not a, it's not a work reduction strategy in my opinion. Um, yeah. so, so what would you, what would you say to those people who are listening to this and they're employees or maybe they're in trade school um, and they've got those misconceptions. They think that the owner, that being a business owner is, is one way and it's actually something else. What are they missing? Um, what, what was your question? What were they missing? What are they missing yeah. about? What do uh, they, being- what do they not understand that, that their boss is dealing with? What are the not so obvious stresses and obligations that oh, a business owner yeah. is dealing with. Well, everybody has a boss. You know, we have to answer to general contractors and general contractors have to answer to bankers and architects and developers and, you know, building owners and on down the line, everybody has a boss somewhere. Uh, I think that's the main thing that, uh, everybody has a boss. Yeah. I think that's a misconception to think that at some point I'm not going to answer to anybody. Right. Um, Even if you're the CEO of a 
publicly traded company, you're going to answer to your customers. You're going to answer to a board of directors. You're going to answer to somebody. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a big one. Um, anything mm-hmm. else? Like, well, let's talk about, let's talk about cash flow. What, what do people not understand? What, what is behind, what's going on behind the scenes when it comes to cash flow? Well, it just takes having to uh, get your, all your billings and paperwork, paperwork done in a timely manner and staying on top of people regularly. We had to call people to chase down money all the time. Um, it doesn't just flow in. You know, we have tough customers and uh, not very often, but sometimes you'll have a difficult customer who's not happy with the work and different things that you have to kind of bend over backwards and do things you don't agree with a lot of times to just kind of make peace or just to keep things moving. You you might not always work with people that you like a lot or things of that nature. Yeah. The the term cash flow makes friends all the time. Yeah. It's kind of a, end up with some adversarial relationships occasionally, but just had to be able to deal with it and move on. Yeah. Yeah. The term cash flow makes it sound like it just flows to you. Doesn't it? It's just like you turn yes. on the spigot and it's like just opening up the faucet. It's like cash just flows to you. Right. And in my experience, sometimes it's more like, I'm not sure what the term would be. It's more like cash extraction or yeah. cash hunting and, yeah. um, cash threatening to, exactly. to to get cash in the door. Yeah. Yeah. And you have those customers that'll talk with you the, throughout the whole project. We'll just have perfect communication. And then once the invoice goes out, it's radio silence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chase them down and all of a sudden their phone's off and it's just crazy. There's only a select few. Most of our customers are great to deal with. They're, they're just a, small handful that are the difficult ones that try to either weed out and you would think they'd understand that you end up having to charge them more because they're so difficult to deal with. And, you know, most people don't want to work with people like that. So, you know, end up charging more to have to deal with them or back burner them. Or yeah. Or the ones I've dealt with have typically been, um, they're not looking for a long-term, they're actually looking for a contractor to burn, to take right. advantage of, yeah. and they have no intention of ever doing another project. I, yeah. I've been screwed over a few times by those types. Yeah, I'm getting better at, at catching that a little earlier, but some occasionally one will slip through, um, especially now with the virus and everything we haven't really wanted to turn down any work so people call in we're uh, afraid to say no and want to keep the backlog going um so you know one might slip in there so let me ask you this um what let's say a, a builder or a developer somebody contacts you about a project and you've never worked with them before what kind of stuff makes your spider sense go off that makes you that raises some red flags that this, this outfit might be a, a risk. Are there any red flags that you look for that kind of make, make the hair on the back of your neck stand up or give you a sick feeling? Well, leans, uh, we, we follow the, uh, it's the new orders weekly, which is a, uh, lean reports, that come out every week. So uh, that's one thing we've started doing is monitoring the, the liens that come out every week. So, and we've had it happen where we'll see a, a concrete contractor or a, a lumber supplier has filed a lien and then a couple, you know, month or two later, they'll be calling looking for drywall and I'll be like, Oh, well, we're busy. <laughs> so it, it's kind of helped us. That's that's the main thing is the the liens. You can see people getting liens put on their projects. It makes it a little nerve wracking. I mean, there has been legitimate cases where it's just a financial misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. People 
file the, go ahead and file the land just to protect their money and then everything works out, but it, it's still a little sketchy. And what's out. the name of that report? It's called new orders weekly. I don't know if that's a Oklahoma thing or, um, I, I think it is. <clears throat> gotcha. It's a subscription based, uh, report that we get. We get all the permits, permits that were pulled in the area as well as the liens that were filed for that previous period. So it, I think it comes out on Fridays. That's good. It's yeah. Well worth it. Well and worth it. Uh, uh, ballpark, how much do you pay for that a month? I think it's like 40 bucks a month. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's saved us a few times. Mm, that's good. That's good. Okay. And then we also know the permits that are coming out. So we can kind of yeah. judge by if things are slowing down by less permits being pulled or if things are going to look like they're holding steady. And so far there's just been about the same amount of permits pulled. So I assume that everything will get back to normal. Yeah. Um, sidebar, do you have any other reports like that, whether magazines, industry newsletters, anything like that that you look at to keep tabs on sort of like this uh, new orders weekly? Uh, not really that just industry related, like um, I read construction dimensions magazine and just, and uh, walls and ceilings magazine. I get a lot of new products and materials that have come out I hear about it there. That's, that's the main deal there. Gotcha. Yeah. I've heard of walls and ceilings, but I'll have to check out construction dimensions. That's a new one to me. What, what, what's it about? Uh, just drywall and metal framing, um, acoustics, insulation. I'll have, um, estimator articles in there. Um, it's pretty well done. I, um, they're both real similar, uh, Ephus and stucco, mm. uh, anything within the wall and ceiling trades. Gotcha. Gotcha. For those magazines. I appreciate the recommendations. Um, yeah. So let's talk about failures or mistakes. This is kind of an unusual question, but has there been a failure or apparent failure that has set you up for later success? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I tried uh, my hand at the business early on when I was young and was able to keep it going for quite a few years. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot from that first experience doing, we were doing mostly commercial work then. Um, I learned definitely what not to do and it set me up for being su successful now um, by knowing not what to do. And what was, what's one of those things when you think about what not to do? What's one of the first things that comes to mind? Trying to do everything myself. I tried to do my, uh, my own bookkeeping, my own estimating, uh, running the field, um, purchase materials, uh, everything I tried to do myself. I didn't, I didn't want to have to hire somebody in to help me because, you know, I always felt, well, might as well just do it myself because they're not going to be able to do it the way I want it done. And I just overextended myself and <clears throat> I wasn't really good. Um, being young and starting out, you want people to like you. So when change orders would come about, I, I wouldn't be the best at, um, getting things in writing, I would trust people too much. And, you know, even people that are trustworthy uh, and that you are likable uh, get amnesia at the end of a job. It's so, funny how that works. It is. Yeah. So that's one thing I learned was to get it in writing. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Um, um, is there a specific, like one specific mistake that you made that if, if you had, if, if you had it to do over again, you would avoid like for me. And I, I talked about this, I had a, a webinar called FailCon 
few weeks ago. Oh, I had yeah. three or four, maybe four other guys, three or four other guys talk about like, what was the biggest mistake you ever made? Like, and I talked about for me, my biggest mistake was I bought a commercial building. It was a 64,000 square foot um, former big box store. And um, I, that was the biggest mistake I ever made. And oh, it, yeah. there were several things that contributed to that. And if I could pinpoint one decision that I made, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> the best $10,000 check I could have thrown away would have been the earnest money deposit that I wrote <laughs> for that. I would have been better off to say, keep that 10 grand. Just keep it. I don't want your building, but uh, my life would be very different if, if I hadn't done that. So is there one specific decision that <clears throat> if you could go back and change that, uh, that you would, or that was a, ended up being a big mistake? I can't really pin it down to one particular mistake. It was more of a whole uh, bunch of small mistakes kind of compounded on top of each other. But if I could think of one thing that caused the downfall of the whole thing was uh, not charging enough. Well, I guess two things, not charging enough and not staying up with like tax liabilities and things like that, because um, I ended up falling kind of behind early on because um, I wasn't charging enough. Uh, you know, you don't realize all the overhead involved and everything. And, uh, uh, I kind of fell behind and once you fall behind then you have the, the fees and stuff assessed with their penalties and it's, it, it's just really hard to get out from under that. And, uh, I've seen a lot of people get in tax trouble, uh, <clears throat> and it ends up taking them down because of that, you know, not staying up with it. So I would definitely, uh, say that that's the main thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it seems like the the downward spiral is um, not understanding overhead costs and all the indirect costs, not charging enough, and then cash flow gets tight, so you don't pay your taxes. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Yeah. And then you get behind, fees start adding up, <clears throat> start cutting your prices to get more work, and then you just start circling the drain and the this, this downward spiral of uh, bankruptcy and destruction. And so I think to me, a, a really good place to start, good piece of advice that I wish I had when I started my business was understand your numbers, understand overhead, understand cash flow, understand it's not so much about profit. I hear a lot of people talking about, well, how much margin or markup should I charge? And yeah. my advice is like, hey, that that's a good question, but there are other bigger questions you really need to understand. You can't, I tell people, you can't spend percentages at the bank. You can't pay your mortgage with a percentage. You need to generate cash. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Um, so that's, that's really good advice. Well, I, I see a lot of people doing, that's another bit of advice I would give is don't do things for other people's numbers. I see, um, especially like on these Facebook groups, I'm a member of different groups, uh, trade related. And I'll see people, Hey, how much do you charge for, uh, this or how much for a house for, you know, to do this on a house or whatever. And, uh, I would always tell these people, Hey, the quickest way to go out of business is doing stuff for other people's prices, but you know, nobody listens, but you see it just go on and on and, <clears throat> you, you're absolutely right. You do need to know your numbers. Know yeah. what know what bottom uh, uh, number like you need to keep things running. The quickest the quickest way to go out of business is to to do work based on somebody else's numbers. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because um, yeah, it's it, this is a, a question I, I see a lot in Facebook groups. What what per, mm. what's what margin percentage should I add or what? What markup yeah. should I be working at? I'm like it yeah. doesn't. It depends. That's my answer. What well, depends? It depends oh, on yeah. your overhead. It depends on your your uh, the type of work. It it's just not as simple as putting a percentage on there. And mm -hmm. you really have to understand the fundamentals and your costs yeah. in order for it to to work out. 
Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I, I like that. There's a great book out there. You're talking about resource material uh, called Markup and Profit Solutions. I read, um, oh, it's been several years ago now, but he really breaks down uh, how to cost out a job and, and knowing where your costs are. He goes really into detail about it. And uh, it's really a great book. What was the name again? Markup and Profit Solutions. Uh, it's a guy named Mike Stone. Michael Stone. Uh, really, really great book. He has one on sales also. But that, that book was really helpful. Uh, in fact, that was when I kind of started making a little bit more money was after going through that book and applying some of his key principles in there on knowing where your numbers are at. Uh, have figuring out what your actual overhead percentage is and what's what's your bottom number. You can't go below this price no matter what or you're yeah. losing money. Mm-hmm. And people will be very surprised to find out where that number actually is. Yeah. It's yeah, that's a lot, a lot higher than you think is the bottom where you should be. <laughs> Yeah, I, I call that your uh, floor price. Like once you f- you figure out what your floor price is, like mm-hmm. you can't go below this. <clears throat> it takes a lot of the emotion out of selling. Yeah. And if somebody wants to try to negotiate you down, you get down to your floor price, and then you just have to say no, or yeah. you have to to say yes means you're gonna you might as well write them a check. So right. at some point, right. you might as well just say what I'm gonna write you a check for ten grand <laughs> to do this job. <laughs> You go find somebody else and then I'm going to go do something else. At least that way I can go make some profit. But that's, that's literally what some people are doing They're They might as well just, they're writing a check at the end of a, I call that unsolicited philanthropy or unsolicited charity. <laughs> yeah. We've yeah. Done our fair share of that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, so uh, tell me about somebody who's had a significant influence on your career or your business? One, one specific person could be an author, family member, speaker, somebody that, uh, is, that you know, but is there anybody that comes to mind? Well, there's a couple of people that I admire. Um, have uh, the Freeman family that's from Freeman Products. They're a mud manufacturer here in, in uh, Tulsa area. Um, I've always admired them, you know, Bill and uh, Dwayne Freeman. Uh, they've just always been really good people to deal with and uh, always just admired them. I've never, you know, I've went hunting, hunting with them before, but I haven't spent a ton of time with them. I've, you know, I'm not like super close with them or anything, but um, I've always admired their family and uh, the way they take care of their employees. They're real kind of family oriented business. Um, what, uh, what's one thing that they do that, um, that stands out to you? Uh, they take care of, uh, people in our trade in the drywall business. They really look after their customers and, um, you know, they hold like these different fishing tournaments and, uh, they have a ranch where they take people, hunting and um, I'm sure it's not unique in the supplier world, but for us, it kind of is. It's a real special treat and we get to spend some one-on-one time with them up there at the cabin and hanging out. <clears throat> but uh, I've just seen how they've been to people over the years. I've dealt with them for 25 years so off and on and uh, they've just been real good people. So would you say it's more about like their their products or the technical stuff, or is it about their relationships and the human side? I would say it's more of the relationships and, and human side. Hmm. Um, they're just, I say, good people. Uh, the owner, Bill, he started out as a drywall contractor uh, back in the 60s, I believe. 60s and 70s and started manufacturing his own material and uh, giving it away, trying to get people to try it out and worked his way up from there to 
um, to this big multinational. I mean, they ship their stuff all over the world. And um, for a guy that's like a multimillionaire, you would know, you know, he's, wears overalls and uh, he's in his nineties now, by the way, that uh, still drives an old pickup and um, just still remembers your name and uh, just super nice guy. So let's say next week, some guy walks into your office and he works for a different supplier and he's like, Mike, listen, what's it going to take for me to earn your business? I can, I can beat Freeman's price by 5%. Um, our products are superior. Our pricing is better. How would you respond? I respond, well, I like Bill, but that sounds like a pretty good deal. <laughs> I mean, we, we do spread it around a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I do like Bill, but, you know, if we have to stay competitive also. Sure. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. But your, is it safe to say your relationship with the family would, would weigh into the, the decision-making process? For sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 But I don't think it would hurt their feelings. I mean, to know that we were buying stuff from other people, they don't, they don't sell all the materials we need anyway. So we get, you know, they, they only sell the mud and the finishing side of it. So uh, whenever we need metal studs or drywall, we have to buy from another supplier anyhow. So <clears throat> we've kind of created relationships with these other suppliers also. And speaking of relationships, you have a lot, a lot of long-term relationships with your, your clients, right? The oh, yeah. ho home builders and general contractors. What, um, what's one thing there are some people who, oh, let's, let's put it this way. To the people who say, Mike, I don't believe relationship has anything to do with it. We're not out here to make friends. It's all about numbers. What would you say to that person? Well, I mean, a lot of time there is truth to that anymore in the competitive market. I mean, uh, numbers are definitely important, but I think relationships are important also. It kind of all depends on the, the person. There are the robotic type, you know, bean counter uh, builders out there, but um, most of the ones you get along with, uh, you kind of become friends with them over time and things of that nature. Uh, I, I think relationships are important. and. <clears throat> Do, um, do custom builders, is it typical for custom builders to bid out every project every time, or is it more typical for them to find a, a, a trade partner that they like and just work with them pretty consistently? Yeah, that mostly uh, they'll continually using you. Uh, most of our customers don't even ask for a bid anymore. They'll just tell us here's this project we have coming up because they know they trust me now and know I'm going to be fair with my price. And, um, I've had things where we'll have added difficulty and, um, we'll have to add a little bit more to the bid. They're usually understanding about it. And yeah, we always try to be, <clears throat> you know, call everybody back the same day and, um, take their schedules into consideration. So I think people have grown to trust us in that regard. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, if you could go back and give your 20 year old self one piece of advice, what would that be? Well, the main thing that comes to mind is protect your credit. Uh, nobody ever taught me that. Like when I was in high school, I didn't know uh, about, credit or how important that was. That was something that I had to repair uh, as a younger, you know, at a younger age, uh, had it pretty decimated with that first business and took a long time to kind of get things rebuilt. <clears throat> but it was one thing I never really considered. And I've always taught my kids uh, at a young age, hey, watch your credit. Don't be even a day late on your payments, just stay on top of that kind of thing because it's hugely important 
you, know, you can't get anywhere in business or anywhere without credit anymore. You know, a lot of uh, uh, employers even look at credit reports and stuff now. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely huge. good advice. That's it's one of those things that if uh, if you make some mistakes, they're really hard, almost impossible, and really slow to to yeah. fix. Definitely, prevention. An ounce of prevention is worth maybe a ton of cure in the case of credit repair. So, yeah, great right. advice there. And with the tax and credit issues from that first business took about 10 years to clean up. And that's just a huge mess to, you know, get past. If you can not go there in the first place, definitely better. Yes. Yeah. Listen to a couple of guys who have made mistakes in the past. Don't think that you're going to be special. I'll figure it out. They won't catch me. It won't catch up to me. I won't make those mistakes. Um, Maybe. Maybe you're right, but yeah. I'm telling you, if, if, if you don't pay your taxes and you don't price your work right and you don't protect your credit, it will catch up with you. It's not a matter of if, but, but when it's, sure. it's coming. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of advice, assume that you're talking to a smart, driven high school student who's about to enter the real world. What, what advice would you give them? What's one piece of advice? Well, I thought we just covered that. <laughs> Protect your... Is that, is that the same? Did I just ask I mean, the same question twice? I probably did. Like Maybe I did. Sorry about that. So, yeah. look, oh, this is what I meant to ask. What okay. is, what's one piece of advice that young, smart people should ignore? That everyone has to go to college. Mm. Uh, some people just aren't cut out for college. Um, some people just don't like school. They want to get out of school. They want to get to earning money. Um, that's how I was. I, I wanted to put high school behind me. I wanted a job and I wanted to make money. It wasn't until I was in my thirties that I decided I wanted to go back to college and started caring about education. Mm. Um, I think, uh, that comes later for a lot of people. They're still kind of figuring themselves out and making their own way. You know, and so I don't think everybody has to go to college right out of high school. Um, yeah, I would agree. Definitely. Um, that's something that you just, it's somehow become this expectation. Maybe mm-hmm. it's because it's preached so much in high school and middle school yeah. and even all the way down into elementary school. But yeah. um, college, well, I can tell you, I went, I went into college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do started off in mechanical engineering. I looking back, I don't know what I was thinking. Then my, Mm. somebody talked me into agricultural engineering for a year. Mm. I don't know what I was thinking. And it wasn't until I co-opt for a semester on a commercial construction project in Orlando that I realized I want to do construction. So that's when I, I really figured out what I wanted. And that's when I got serious about it. So yeah. yeah, if if you don't know, listen, if you don't know what you're, what you want to do, college is an expensive place to figure it out. Oh, exactly. And you Absolutely. may be better off working, doing something to, to figure that out. Um, yeah. Great advice there. Yeah. Um, what are, what are some other than advice about college? What are some bad recommendations you hear people giving to young people who are going into construction, specifically young people going into construction, what are some bad recommendations you hear them getting? I don't really hear a lot of people recommending young people Uh, to go into construction. mm -hmm. Uh, It's still the same as, you know, you have to go to college to uh, make your way. I mean, that's all I ever hear. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, you know, to be able to, be successful or to make a lot of money. But I know a lot of contractors that make quite a bit of money, a lot more than a young person would think, you know, as, as a contractor in, in the trades, even just trades people, you know, I know many people make six figure salaries and mm-hmm. just working in the trades. Yeah. So speaking of the trades, let's, let's go off off topic here a little bit. One of the the biggest jumps, one of the biggest challenges I see people 
trying to make is making the jump from working in the field with tools on to working on their business, having time to do estimating and selling and, and hiring people and making the jump from the field to the office. Um, what, what do you think is, if somebody's trying to make that jump, what is one of the things or maybe the thing that they really need to be focused on in order to make that jump? I think they need to be focused on, on what they're good at hmm. um, and do that. And the, you know, there's other areas in the business, you know, the accounting side or the sales side, if those aren't your thing, don't, don't do them. Find people that are good at it to do those parts. And like, for me, I know how to do the book work. I know, I know how to uh, do a P and L statement and, and you know basics of accounting but I hate to do it. I hate to do it. I, I'm more of a, I come from the field and I like to be out in the field. I like to run the guys and, and that's what I'm good at. Um, my son, Josh, he's great at the numbers and uh, that's, that's what he's good at. So <clears throat> that's, I think to figure out what you're good at, figure out what you like to do and concentrate on that and find other people to do the things that you're, that you're weakest. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Um, so that runs up against <clears throat> one of the objections that some people have, which is I have to do it all myself. All right. Um, why? And it sounds like you tried, you tried that at one yeah. point. Um, why do people, why do people think they have, what do contractors specifically think they have to do it all themselves? What do you think? I think a lot of people, contractors especially, uh, feel that nobody else is going to do it right. At least that's how I felt. You know, if you have to explain something to somebody one time, like, well, I just might as well do it myself. It's kind of that mentality. At least for me, that's how I felt. Um, I don't want to show somebody. And what was wrong with that? What? Because I hear that a lot. Like, ah, I might as well just do it myself. If I got to take. 15 minutes longer to, to show you how to do it. I might as well just do it myself. What, what's wrong with that thought process? Well, you're just never going to be able to grow as a business. Um, and for when you're trying to do everything, um, you're not really doing everything well. You might be doing a few things okay, but not to the best of the ability of what it needs to be. Um, like I said, and some people very well can multitask and uh, be great at it. I'm speaking for me personally, uh, I find I'm a lot better just focusing on one thing at a time. Uh, yep. Yep. <clears throat> that's, that's good advice. Um, you've probably hired and fired a few people in your day. Um, what is the, the number one thing you look for when you're interviewing a potential employee? Um, reliability and experience, usually. Uh, back uh, in the day, we'd look for just drywall mud on their boots. <laughs> but um, no, it's more... Uh, reliability and, and past work history. Um, I've been here in Tulsa and we're a small enough town where most of us know each other. And um, if somebody's comes and hits me up for a job, I usually know who they used to work for and um, that kind of thing, you know, it's small town. So reliability makes perfect sense. How do you, how do you determine if somebody is reliable or not? What are some either questions you ask them or what do you do to determine if they're reliable? <clears throat> uh, usually it's call their previous employer or just give them a chance. Uh, the way the economy has been, everybody's just been dying for help. So I think we've loosened our uh, requirements some um, just to be able to get people on the job and a little, little more open to giving people opportunities. And, uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I, I've found <clears throat> uh, a few times over the years, 
a look into somebody just moving here from out of state. That's that's usually my been my best hires is somebody that's just newly to the area. That's um, you know wife had gotten transferred here or something that effect, and you know get good good employees that way. Um, if you're looking if you think about the people who have come to work for you that came from somewhere other than the drywall trade, are there specific backgrounds that seem to work better? Like for example, the company I ran, we were in the middle of Kentucky and frankly, farm boys. If somebody grew up on a farm, Mm -hmm. for the most part, they worked out pretty well. Are there any, leading indicators like that, whether it's if if, hmm, this guy used to be in fill in the blank, Mm -hmm. most of those guys work out pretty well. Are there any, anything like that that you can think of? Well, farm boys know hard work. And I think that's most country people are raised a little differently. You know, they, they know hard work. And, um, so yeah, they generally make good carpenters and stuff, but, for drywall finishing, I think uh, painters, uh, somebody that's a good painter that knows what it's supposed to look like, uh, that's been kind of interchangeable and a, a partner trade for the drywall finishing side of it anyway. Um, yeah, and I should go back and say farm boys and farm girls certainly have been good sure, indicators. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would say uh, from, a, like from an administrative standpoint, um, you mentioned – finding somebody, well, knowing what your strengths are, what you're good at and finding somebody else, um, find somebody that is, if you're not detail oriented, then hire somebody in your office that is ridiculously detail oriented. That is a little bit anal retentive maybe because you need that. You're, they're going to balance you out. Um, and I, I think um, finding somebody who came from like a loan processing or a banking background, maybe they don't know anything about construction, but you know what? They don't really need to know that much about construction. You need somebody who's detail oriented and organized and won't put up with your crap and they'll tell you (laughs) when you need to change. Right. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. You want somebody that'll shoot straight with you. Yep. Yep. All right. Last question um, on this list. If somebody said, Mike, I'm planning to start my own construction business and you could only ask them one question, what would that question be? The question that they really need to think about before they go down this path, what would that question be? Uh, How much money do you have in the bank? Can you cover a couple months of payroll without being paid? Um, And why, why are you wanting to go into business would be my main questions. Um, cause I wasn't really prepared my first time <laughs> either didn't have enough money in the bank. And, uh, so that'd be my main question is do you have um, enough to cover yourself for a while? So the, the financial, the money question that makes perfect sense. You got to manage, you're going to have to float the business for a while until you, you yeah. get paid. Um, but do you know how to estimate? (laughs) Oh yeah. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. That's where it all, a lot of it goes wrong. I'm curious about why the, the, the why question. Um, some people overlook the importance of being clear on why they want to go into business. Um, why is it important to know why you want to go into business? Well, I mean, you go into business for the wrong reasons and be sadly disappointed. You know, if you go into think that you're just going to make it rich or have all this free time. Uh, it's a kind of a misconception. I guess you can, you can make free time for yourself. I mean, it's not, that is one thing I love about being a business owner is now that my son is on board with me and I have the right people in place. Um, I can have a little bit more freedom. I, a lot of times I'll, I'll choose to, to work because that's what I like to do. And I want to make sure everything is, running well, but, um, I just, I think it's important to do things for the right reasons and, uh, that's it. Yeah. I I completely agree. Completely agree. Um, it's really important to know why you want to do it. Uh, I, I, I've worked with people who started a business so that they could work in the field 
all the time. And then they found themselves working in the office and they hated it and they felt handcuffed and trapped. And it all started because they weren't clear on why they wanted to do it. And um, that's definitely, definitely great advice. Yeah. Um, So uh, another question for you, we've, we've been working together. You joined the construction business accelerator program a while back. And Mm -hmm. then we started working together in my coaching program. Um, If it's been helpful at all, and I'm not sure that it has, what, uh, Mm. what, what benefits um, have you gotten out of uh, working in in my programs? Well, we've uh, started getting some more systems in place and you've helped us get more organized as far as, um, fine tuning everything. Um, you know, we thought we had had things kind of figured out, but, you know, looking at, uh, financials, I knew we could tighten things up quite a bit. And, um, you know, I just want to make sure that we're staying strong and healthy. And <clears throat> we, uh, I discovered your podcast and started listening to those and they're real helpful. Um, so, you know, it's, that's been the main thing is getting systems in place. Yeah. And, um, is there any one specific thing, whether you, uh, something we worked on, on our coaching calls or something in the construction business accelerator that was most, most helpful or most impactful? I think getting on that Monday, uh, app that you hooked us up with, uh, that's been extremely helpful. It's kind of organized all our information in one place. And um, it, that's that's been the biggest game changer because it's all right there. I don't have to go to multiple places to find the specs for a job or um, it's all just there and click on an address. And um, I just wish it interlinked with T-sheets. Mm-hmm. We'd already been using T-sheets uh, for quite a while. So that that's been really helpful too. <clears throat> gotcha. Good stuff. All right. Well, Mike, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, man. Uh, if people, right. want, if, if people want to find out uh, more about you, whether it's go to your website or connect with you on social media, where are the best, where's the best place or the best places they should go to do that? Uh, Drywall918.com is our website. Um, that's the best place. Okay. We're, we're also on Facebook at uh, McCollum and Sons at, uh, I don't know, I guess Facebook.com. <laughs> I don't know. It's just M- McCallum and Sons. Got it. And I'll have those links in the show notes as well. Got it. Great. Well, man, I appreciate you taking the time to do, to do this. Right. This is going to help a lot of people. And um, yeah. Thanks a lot. And I'll see you on the next call. Great. Sounds good. Thanks. There you go. Make sure and check out the show notes for this website or for this podcast that are on the podcast player of your choice. And you'll see the links where you can get in touch with Mike, follow him on social media. You'll also find out more about those resources that I mentioned at the top of the podcast that are specifically designed and selected to help you eliminate chaos and maximize profitability on your projects. If you want to eliminate profit bleeds in your business, then go to my website, constructionleadingedge.com and uh, schedule a call with me. If you want to find out more about those uh, resources that Mike mentioned specifically, there are also links to T-Sheets and Monday.com, two two tools that he is using specifically. Those are in the show notes as well. As always, thank you so much for the ratings and the reviews. If you could take a minute to share this podcast with somebody who would get some value out of it and leave a rating and a review on the podcast player that you're using, that really helps get the word out there. I appreciate it. If there's anything I could do for you, Uh, You can find me over at constructionleadingedge.com, and I will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.